Okay, I'm going to talk about the compacticity and uh, here is the outline of that talk. I will mention basics of transient current technique. So for those who may not be so familiar with uh, the concept, then I will list examples of analysis of measured currents and uh, we will concentrate mostly on silicon. So we'll have a look at how you see the space charge, how you can determine the full depletion voltage, charge collection efficiency, effective trapping times, let's say mobility, and you can see the effect of ch changing resistivity. So these are all, I would say, educational examples, but don't be, let's say, uh, led into the conclusion that this is only for educational purposes. This, if you are doing a material study, these are really uh, very, very, very uh, meaningful measurements. The third part of the talk will be about the setup and its operation. It will consist of some videos. So we will have a look how this is operated. And then we'll have uh, another part of the talk, which will be on examples of data taking. So again, you'll see how the curves look like when they're taken. And there will be a, a slide on analysis tools at the end, really a single slide. And then the conclusions is actually an uh, invitation for your questions. So let's go to the basics of transient current technique. It was uh, actually uh, introduced or dates back in the 60s and the technique itself is is basically observing effects of non-equilibrium carriages in different devices so if you look at it this is this is what we usually uh, consider a simplified view of a detector so you have two plates cathode and anode you have a medium in between which gets ionized in this case, this is semiconductor. And then you have the electrons going one, the, the, the holes going into uh, another direction. And what you actually look in transient current technique is the current induced. Most of the applications in high energy physics uses the, the charge, so how much charge you collect. And the, the advantage of looking at the current is, of course, that you get much more information about your sensor. So from 90s on, the technique was widely used in studies of semiconductor detector materials, mostly PET detectors at the beginning. So the effects, uh, the, the changes of the space charge after irradiation of devices, for example, trapping times, charge collection. There are many, many studies that were, uh, 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 that exploited the benefits of the TCT. Then in the recent decade, the use of scanning TCT, so the ones that I introduced in the first talk, uh, where the focus laser beams are used, uh, are, are getting way more popular for obvious reasons, because you can actually study strip, pixel, 3D sensors, whatever device you have in mind, and you can access it with a laser, you can, of course, look into it. Uh, and uh, let me just tell you what we are going to look now. We are going to explain some basics, so how, how, uh, how the, 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 what the current in TCT means, give some practical advices using uh, or customizing a TCT system. Then uh, some examples of what can be done with TCT and then uh, really the core is the introduction to this compact TCT. So if you want, in short, this is the TCT. So you have a, sen uh, a sample, you have a laser plus optical system, which shines on the surface of the sample, it basically what you want is to mimic uh, here in the bottom, you can have a look how the particle ionizes the sensor. You want to do the same or similar thing with the laser. The next thing is the, the how you connect your electrodes to the electronics. 
remember, we want to look at the currents, and the currents are of nanosecond, are of nanosecond order. So you really need to have high bandwidth um, components, and it. It's not as simple as it looks like a resistor and a capacitor, as you can imagine. But this is basically what it is. And then you have a fast transient uh, uh, current amplifier. And uh, the third part is a digital oscilloscope or a digitizer. And that is basically it. So it has three components. And uh, you can study a lot of things with it but this system can also be used with instead of the laser you can use the alpha particles i will show you one example of that or you can use the micro bin and there are plenty of examples but i will not show them today so and then you get basically the same thing so like i said uh, uh, the, the the normal or the CCT that we are looking today uses uh, laser and as you can imagine, laser has many advantages over the particles. For, for I listed five of them, the most obvious ones. So if you have a laser, there is no problem with noise, right? Because you can average and you can repeat your, you can shoot as many pulses as you like uh, and to get the, the shape of the signal in your sensor. So this is a this is good thing. The other thing is you can trigger it so you know exactly when the laser pulse uh, uh, comes, so you, you know exactly when to look at your signal. You can use different wavelengths of laser, and that means uh, different penetration depth in your device, in this case silicon. You can tune the intensity basically from few photons to huge amount of, uh, uh, let's say, electron hole pair, so large deposited energy. And uh, you can, to some extent, even in the compact ECT, control the beam position. So, so what does that mean? How how fast should the the uh, uh, the pulses be? They should be of order of hundred picoseconds. So, if you connect any reasonable electronics to it, you will introduce the 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 uh, RC, which is likely of order of few hundred picoseconds. So going to femto for the signal formation alone, there are other effects which maybe femto lasers are much better, but for going to femto just uh, to, to, to have a faster pulse uh, with the normal devices, it does not uh, present a high or, or very significant advantage. What you have to pay attention with the laser, and this is, uh, usually the case is that uh, you don't have any bleeding. So the pulse laser should really have no photons outside the pulse itself. So it cannot be that you just modulate it or something. It really needs to be uh, uh, without any uh, photons outside of the pulse. That is particularly true if you're looking at some very cold operation. So the lasers look very promising and advantages uh, have a lot of advantages of the particles, but you should not forget that uh, if you use wide band gap semiconductors, so if you use, for example, diamond, it's very difficult to get the laser uh, that has enough ener uh, photon uh, energy. Then you have different effects uh, due to the uh, laser pulses. If they are focused, you can create a lot of uh, charge and you can have uh, screening effects or plasma effects is called. And of course, the most important one is that if you want to study the structure that is underneath the metal, you cannot access this with laser. So it's much less, uh, uh, you need to, to design your devices with this in mind. I just have a look at the uh, laser uh, uh, laser flavors for silicon, for example. So if you go to 160 nanometer, your laser goes one millimeter into the device. So this is indicated here. And this basically mimics the mi minimum ionizing particle. So it deposits the roughly uh, homogeneous amount of electron hole carriers, uh, uh, electron hole pairs along the track. If you go lower, 
with uh, if you if you uh, reduce the wavelength it penetrates less and less and less and at 405 nanometers which is uh, currently the smallest wavelength that we uh, uh, have with our lasers you are at around 100 nanometers now in recent uh, let's say years other materials are getting uh, popular or, or even very popular like silicon carbide calcium nitride and to some extent okay diamond and at least for these two we are now getting into so this is the band gaps so we are getting uh, close to the way the, the laser diodes that we are using are getting close to the to the required uh, wavelengths to actually use also TCT with these devices. So uh, this is, it looks very promising also for other semiconductor materials. So how do we connect this electrically? There are two configurations, uh, which both can be used in the compact TCT. The default one is uh, with bias T, which means that you actually have the everything at ground and you bias your sensor and read it out from the top this has a lot of practical advantages uh, it's much easier to ground uh, shield uh, uh, cool but it's not so appropriate if you for example would have let's say two electrodes so for multi-channel operation there you would need to put uh, high voltage at the, at the at the back side and then you can use it without it, the bias T, but it's much more difficult to realize the, to realize the, the connections. So if you look at the, what the electronics components uh, uh, need to fulfill, you need to have first, like I said, they have to be, the bandwidth should be very uh, large on both sides, on the low and on the high, so that you can reproduce your currents as much as possible so the, the the true induced current is then uh, uh, what you measure is actually corresponds to that uh, it has to stand the bias t if you're using it uh, really high voltages thousand volts or so the amplifiers can be of different amplification depends what you want to do and what, how your digitizer or di or digital oscilloscope looks like so can go from 20 decibel to 53 decibel and uh, what you should pay attention in connecting all these things is that uh, everything is uh, shielded uh, with as few patch connections as possible, that you have a very good impedance matching so that uh, uh, you don't get the reflections uh, distorting your signals. Now, let, now this is the, the part on the introduction of the TCT. Now we move to uh, examples of measured currents so uh, most of the samples that we use look uh, similar to that so this is a silicon diet quite an old one but you can have all sorts of devices what is important is to have this opening in the metallization where the light can enter and if you look at the uh, how the detector is now uh, sketched so you, you introduce uh, uh, if you use the red light, you create electron hole sparse at the top, so here, and then the electric field pulls the electrons back. This is the n-type uh, uh, p on n uh, diode, of, let's say of 300 micrometers, for this uh, study, and uh, you can observe the the currents. So the current that you observe is actually given here you can see many terms one is the number of electron hole pairs that you create this term actually comes into the game only when you have damaged sensors we'll come to that later the most important is that what you measure is actually the velocity of moving electrons and from that you can then conclude on the electric field and on on the full depletion voltage on, on many many things so let me show you so that there are some illustrations of how this looks like so you create and you can see how the holes in this case if you inject the light from the back drift you see basically you if you use the short wavelength 
you look only uh, the movement of holes. If you use it from the top, you can only look uh, uh, the movement of electrons, and you can nicely see how these currents look like. Yeah. So you see, this is a high resistive pn diode so the the space charge is very low and you get very nice examples of long signals over 100 nanoseconds and you can see that for example in this case the, the current rises because the electric field rises uh, it's the, the the junction is here so it moves from low field to high field if you inject from the top you actually move from the high field to the low field so this is better shown here so if you inject hole here, so you create this electron hole pairs here, electrical field pulls holes to the other side. And as they move into ever higher electric field, remember the electric field in reversely uh, biased uh, silicon diet is, uh, let's say, linear. And you can nicely see this linear behavior also in your signals. Uh -huh. So you can see also the, the diffusion, so the longer the the drift lasts the more the carriers diffuse apart and the longer the tail and if you look at for the uh, for the front injection so you, you see the opposite picture so now you inject in the high field and as they move to the other side they see less and less electric field and then they finish their drift so basically this is the, the whole thing what we learned now is we already know how to determine the sign and to some extent the shape of the field because the field has the same shape as the current right so this is a, a very important study so it tells you that uh, whatever you find in the silicon textbooks about the, the field in the diode is actually true and you can easily check it in a most let's say simple way now this is a bit off uh, maybe not so educational but what we studied in the past is uh, uh, radiation damage of this so once they are operated in different environments they change their properties and this is example of the same diet as you've seen before remember before the current for the whole injection was low and then it increased as you can see that uh, after some damage the same current has a different shape and this was uh, let's say some 30 years ago when it was first discovered uh, it was called the space charge sign inversion in damaged silicon and uh, you can clearly see how uh, nicely see how this uh, uh, can be measured and observed and then if you look from the front injection you see exactly the 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 the, the mirror image so again now we introduce the electrons in low field and they go to high field and what was very let's say heavily studied some 20 years ago was this so-called double junction where you see slightly higher field here and then you have a minimum in the field and then you have again the rise in the field so all this can be relatively easily seen uh, in, in such a system of course now, if you want to, like I said, if you want to uh, simulate your minimum ionizing particle, so this is what you measure, and this is, uh, you have to use the infrared, uh, so 1,600, uh, 1,060 nanometer uh, wavelength, and you basically, what you see here is this triangular shape. So this is coming from electrons, this is coming from holes, and this is then the sum of both is the red and this is this is triangular shape you see later in the in the uh, uh, fifth part of the talk you will see the measurement of this you will see exactly how it's uh, actually measured on the screen what people mostly use the particle detectors uh, is to integrate the charge of course now if you have the current is no big dig <laughs> it's not not the big secret that you get the charge that is uh, collected by such a device by integrating the current and the nice thing is that you can actually uh, if you do the analysis offline you can change this integration time window and you can explore things like ballistic deficits so when if you say your uh, your electronics in real life maybe will 
integrate only 20 pico uh, 20 nanoseconds uh, your your signal then you can see how much charge you can lose if your signals are longer so all these things are uh, um, of course immediately obtained from the shape of the current so in this case for example this is the red laser you can also see that uh, uh, the charge is actually even below the full depletion it's almost 100 percent I don't want to go too much into that, but this is something that was uh, <coughs> that is uh, uh, well explained by the semiconductor device physics. And then maybe more interesting is if you look at the whole injection, so you inject from the back and you can clearly see you get no charge. And as long as the device is not depleted, so when the electric field touches your back, then you get the full charge. So this is a very nice way of, of knowing when exactly your device is fully depleted. Another thing was, uh, for example, if you want to study the effects of the undepleted bulk, so that's uh, some more elaborate physics, you can actually use the infrared light and you can see clearly that if you want to have for non irradiated device or for non-damaged silicon, it, it, the full depletion can be nicely determined by having charge versus square root of bias voltage and if it's irradiated it has to be with the bias voltage like i said this this is shows that uh, how the undepleted bulk resistivity changes with radiation and it's also something that you can nicely see in the tct from these shapes yeah so one of the studies that uh, is usually done at uh, the ICFA school, these setups, the, the compact TCT is also used at ICFA, uh, so uh, this is instrumentation school for particle physics, is the mobility measurement. So if you have a high, resist, uh, high resistivity silicon diode, you can actually, so it looks like that. So this is the electric field profiles, different bias voltages. So this is under depleted, this is just depleted. And then as you increase the bias, the electric field shape looks like that. And if you are high enough with the bias, you can say, okay, the, I have a small uh, difference between the maximum and the minimum field. I can approximate with the average field. And if you do it, then you can say the drift velocity is just the, the the thickness of your device divided by the drift time. So drift time is usually defined as a, a full width at half maximum of your pulse. All the examples that I'm showing are on the same sample. So all the all the all the measured plots are on the same sample. So you can directly compare uh, them. And then if you say that your uh, velocity is uh, mobility times the electric field, then you say, okay, I have an average electric field bias voltage divided by thickness, then you can actually measure the mobility by simply measuring, by knowing the voltage thickness and measuring the drift uh, the time. And uh, <clears throat> this is something that students uh, do and they actually measure the the, the the mobility and also the saturation velocity and then you can heat or cool your sample and you can measure also the effect of the temperature on mobility so a lot of semiconductor physics in a very simple um, in, with a very simple measurement so i what i wanted to show you since i mentioned that we can also use the the alpha particles instead of the laser if you have for example if your lab or your uh, practicum exercise at the university has a meritium source so this is for example the single crystal in diamond using this method you see that there is basically no space charge so this is really a linear field in the diamond and you can see how the the pulses come together and if you use this method this is the mobility parameterization in diamond so you can see unlike in silicon the holes are more mobile than the electrons so a very simple measurement, but uh, it has a lot of physics inside. One of the things uh, that uh, TCT uh, became very well known for is the uh, trapping. So if you have silicon with defects, this is something that you can well study with it. This is just an example of uh, determining the trapping of the drifting charge. So 
as you've seen in the previous slides, as soon as the diet is fully depleted, you get a constant charge, of course, you collect all the charge you generate in your sensor, but in, in damaged silicon, this is not the case, so this is where the default depletion is, and then if you apply higher bias, the charge still arises. The explanation is very simple, and it's illustrated here, so you generate electron hole carrier, uh, um, free carriers, and as the electrons move, so here are generated, they start to move, and if you have a damaged silicon, some of them get trapped, and as they get trapped, they don't uh, induce current anymore, and you get less charge collected at the end, and this is described by this, uh, the probability of this trapping is 1 over the trapping time, so the less time the carrier spends in your sensor, the, the 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 less likely it is going to get trapped, and this is this exponential term, and what you can do, you can exploit this rise here to determine the uh, trapping time by simply what you measure, you correct for the exponential with this time constant, and if you did it right, then you restore in this corrected waveform, you restore this the, the fact that above the full depletion voltage, your charge will not change because you collect all the charge. And uh, if you don't do it right, you get uh, either more charge at lower voltages or more charge at higher voltages. When you do it right, it's flat. And this is the, the measurement of the uh, of the effective trapping time. So uh, there were a lot of studies done. I have a list of the publications that use that. So. This is the list, so there are just few examples there. There is a very long list with every single of this. So the space charge and electric field profile. This is the first publication with the TCT on that. Then you have charge collection efficiency and multiplication, even that you can measure. So this is uh, here. The effective trapping times are here. Mobility measurement is one that is more recent, a very precise study. Here, the trapping times, I didn't mention it, but you can also mention that. And all this is actually doable with this device. So, whatever you see here can be done with that. So, yeah. Like I said, lately, other materials are getting more and more popular. And we are uh, now trying to, to, to get the hand on the on the correct uh, laser diets to actually uh, investigate also these devices. Let me now show you how it looks. Uh, I have to... Oh, that, that was supposed to be an animation, so... I'm not sure why it doesn't want to... Ah, okay, it's here. So I will now play a video and in between we will discuss a little bit how the system looks like. So this is uh, how you set it up for oper uh, for uh, operation. So what I'm connecting now is the power supply for the Peltier. There you have a Peltier, I will come to that later, which cools the, cools the surface. So you can actually explore the temperature range between 60 and and zero degree C. Of course, this depends a little bit on the uh, condition in which you operate sensors because you can have some moisture on it. But this is this is the idea. Now we connect the uh, the, the, uh, the the oscilloscope or the digitizing board, which you see here. So this is the trigger. That is the signal. Then we connect the laser bias. The, the laser power supply actually also supplies the power to the amplifier and filters it. So this is the filter here. The high voltage is actually something that uh, you need to have to operate it, but you can, if you do the, the exercise, you can also use the normal batteries. You put, I don't know, five of them or six of them together, depends what uh, voltage it is, and uh, you can then uh, operate it. So what I'm showing here is the, the filter, so you can tune, and I will show it later in the presentation, the laser intensity electronically, of course, 
but you can also uh, reduce it even further uh, with with the neutral density filter. So what you see here is the is is the pulse. Here is the pulse of the coming from this uh, uh, from this sample now. It's already running. Okay. Let me. Oh no, this is still the same slide. Okay, so we are coming now to just show it from different angles. So this is how it is connected at the back. So this is the filter, this is the digitizer, this is the power supply for the laser and the amplifier. So everything connected in the back. So this is the laser, this is the sample. It looks like that. So the housing of the sample is basically a Faraday cage. You glue or you fix your sensor in the middle and you wire bond it, or you can also use pogo pins, but they are a bit less uh, optimal. If you want to have very nice signals, it's good that they are wire bonded, but you can also use the pogo pin. So uh, what I may have missed, but we'll see it later, is that the uh, amplifier and bias T are hidden uh, behind the laser on this side here, and everything is really uh, uh, very close together, so no, no long cables. Uh, and this actually helps a lot in getting uh, less noise in your system. So uh, another one is to see, show you see this is the the cooler. The, you, we have air cooling of the Peltier. Like I said, the, there is a Peltier board, and I, I deliberately run it here to zero that you see that you get some moisture on it because it gets to to actually uh, zero degree C, so I don't advise you to do that, or use nitrogen or dry air to actually blow it in the box. If you want to go that low, be below the dew point. But this is it, so this is uh, uh, the amplifier and the bias D, and you see how everything is, is connected in the box. So pay attention to here, this is the mounting plane. The mounting plane allows you to mount whatever uh, has a lot of holes and uh, uh, <clears throat> also uh, places where you can put the connectors and it's called uh, it's cooled by 50 uh, or 75 watt Peltier so uh, actually uh, if you are able to, 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 to cool it well the hot side you can get even below zero right so it's uh, zero is something that you re easily reach but uh, you, you can go well below but like I said, you have to avoid uh, condensation in freezing. Okay, so let me come to the filter. So th there is, a, like I said, this is the, 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 the filter which has uh, multiple grading. You can use anything you like. So in theory, you can get with the system to few photons, basically. Huh? You set the laser to the intensity which is very low and then you can use additional uh, filters to actually come to, to, to almost single photon level. Okay. Let me move on. So why, why we call it compact? <laughs> it's shown here, everything comes in, a, in, in a such a suitcase. So this is the digitizing board, uh, which is not really the part, but uh, you can get one. Uh, or you use oscilloscope and the rest is really well packed. If you have batteries, even the power supply comes inside. If you use the batteries to, for demonstration, it comes here. So it's really, you can take it and it's a, it's a very powerful uh, measurement technique in, in, in one small box. Let me show you now some examples of data taking. So this is the uh, data uh, acquisition uh, software. Uh, it com it has two parts. One is the, the the control of the laser. The other is the control of the uh, data acquisition uh, voltage source um, scanning over the voltages. And like I said, in this particular study, we we focus uh, we focused we illuminated this part here. And let me just show you. Uh, and in between. Uh, I can explain a few things about, uh, so this is what we are using here is the DRS, uh, PSI DRS uh, digitizer, as you see here. Uh, it is 
really i think it's in the in the high energy physics it's a well known device because it's uh, relatively affordable and it's well integrated it's quite fast and uh, you can you can see it's used in many examples even cayenne builds it in their uh, commercial digitizers so now we are setting the the voltage so we use kitley 237 in this case uh, over the visa and uh, this data acquisition supports several modes of operation in compact uh, tct that we are uh, looking at today we use the ascii data format i will show you the data format later so that it's easily uh, loaded into any uh, data analysis framework you are using um, and uh, yeah, we'll come to that later so this is how the pulse look like at 10 volts we set it to 10 volts this is again the same sample that was shown in the previous analysis. So this is the P on N sample, high resistivity, you see, we inject in low field at 10 volts, it's not depleted, and therefore you have this long tail, I, I deliberately stretch it so that you can see how long the tail looks like. So this is the electron movement on the other side of the, of the diet. So, and uh, the, the pink signal here is actually the trigger signal and laser is operated at 500 Hertz. You can you can have the laser itself can be uh, of course you can trigger it uh, with the data acquisition software but if you want to go to super high frequencies you can also supply ttl trigger so the outside trigger uh, you see this is how a single pulse look like this is the averaging over 200 events and now we'll see how the for example in this case how one of these uh, uh, voltage scans look like so you'll see how the the, the pulse actually changes so we go from zero to 100 uh, volts on this device remember the full depletion is around 18 20 volts and we go to to 200 volts and you will see how the the pulse changes and what i just uh, explained you uh, a short while ago you will be shown also on the display so we set the, the laser intensity, which is right here. I don't want to go into details what these numbers mean, but uh, it just changes if you, if you, it's, it's uh, the pulse width is actually something that changes the intensity. So if you change that, you get more signal. You see now it's getting larger, but we'll use the standard setting for the, for this uh, voltage scan. Now we set it to 500 and then we do run the scan. Now you see if you, this is the interesting thing. If you increase the frequency, you don't see any change. And the reason for that is very simple because what you're observing is uh, a single pulse so what what would change if you look at the longer time scale would just be the number of these signals but each signal is in, should be independent on the of course on the frequency you can test if you have a high rate environment so if you have pulses in your experiment or if you want to use it for some specific study you can set it up to i think it goes to one megahertz can be used electronically if you want to have higher frequency you need to do external trigger no, this is just to, to to save the comments, to switch on and off the the trigger pulse. Let's say that we uh, in this case we will uh, not use it. So we or, or if you don't use it, you just you, you have to select the channels that you record, and now we'll run the scan. So now it goes to zero. What you actually see is flat line, right? So no signal because there is uh, no field. And then as soon as you start uh, biasing the sample, you see the, the signal increases. Now at 20, it's already depleted and you can see that the, the drift ends here. It's not exponential anymore. And then the higher the bias goes, the higher the current and shorter the signal but remember the integral so the charge 
is the same. And you can clearly see the shape of the field, so it's coming from the high field to low field. For educational purposes, the best device would be the one that has a really very low space charge, so that you can clearly see all these effects. But in, in, in scientific use, it's often <laughs> the other way around. What I forgot to say is that uh, the software supports actually almost all power supplies that you find in normal labs, so all the kitlies, also some agilent ones, and so on. And uh, the same is true also for the oscilloscopes. So you can connect Lacroix, Schwarzenrode, and Tektronics to it, as well as these digitizers. And you can clearly see that once you are very high with bias voltage, you'd stop this 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 uh, increase is almost negligible. It looks like flat because the drift velocity is saturating, and this is something that also students, when they do this, they actually look at it. Okay. We go to another example. This time, that was a red laser, right? So now have a look at the infrared laser. So it's basically the same thing. It's going to be a, a lot quicker than the previous one because uh, you already know the details about the software. So, like again, the frequency, the voltage, now we will run it. See, again, no, no signal at uh, zero bias. You can shift the trigger uh, in and out, so where you want to have it. You can also, if you have, if your trigger has a jitter, Sometimes uh, some digitizers or oscilloscope have, you can correct it in the software also so that you get very, very fast rise time. So no jitter um, or minimum jitter uh, here. And then what we will do, we will set now the voltage uh, uh, scan. Uh, what uh, is interesting here, maybe you noticed that the, the polarity or you haven't noticed, but you will notice it now. The polarity is different, and the reason is because we are using, in the previous example, it was 35 decibel uh, uh, amplifier, now it's 53 decibel am, uh, amplifier, and th this one is uh, inverting. So that's why don't get uh, confused about the polarity. So this is what we are actually simulating. And now we'll run the scan. So we check all the, these values. We, do, we use this average TCT, so we are averaging, we are not taking individual waveforms. This can also be done. And uh, just to remind you that this is a 15 kilo ohm centimeter diode, right? So it's a high resistive one. Okay, we, we can really clean the comments and now we start the data tagging. Again, you will be able to see basically the textbook example of how the induced current looks like in a silicon diode. Huh? So at zero, you get at minus 10, it's not depleted, you get this long tail. Yeah? And then at 20, you still may not see that it's fully depleted, but then at 30, you will already see that this here ends and you have this linear part here, is here. And the other linear part is here. So you see this nice textbook example of uh, how the current should look like for the infrared. And it's really like, <laughs> like a textbook. And of course, then you save the measurements, you, you select the name for the file. It's, it's, this is all standard, right? So, okay, let's move on. So one of the features that I think uh, is very useful is actually uh, the laser, or maybe I, I'm not, maybe I can skip the, the whole thing. So what the laser offers you is a single pulse 
any frequency you like. You can use it externally with, uh, like I said, TTL with faster, but you can also program train of pulses and then decide on which one you trigger your data acquisition. So this is very useful, for example, if you study some uh, uh, saturation effects in your uh, semiconductor and things like that. So it offers a lot of versatility, the, the, the controlling of the laser, the electronic one. So. Okay, so the data analysis, like I said, this is how the ASCII files look like. So you have the head, you have the trail, a tail uh, of the file, which is below with all the comments that you wrote. And this is the head. So this is the temperature, the, 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 uh, the, the starting time, the time between two points, the number of points, the number of voltages. Then you have the temperature. It wasn't measured here, so it's all zero. Then you have the voltage points and then you have the, the, the curves uh, in columns, and you can load that in any any tool which you like. What we actually uh, uh, advertise or uh, uh, propose uh, to use is the comprehensive analysis library, which is available in root uh, on any, basically on any uh, platform, operating system that you like which already has all these analysis techniques that I showed uh, built in. So you load the file and then you can say what you want and it will do it for you. So this is something uh, that handles uh, the analysis, the processing. I, did, I didn't go into that. So how you can deconvolute your signals for electronics in, and all this is possible. It, it's a bit too deep. Uh, and then visualization and the storage and you can uh, have a look uh, at the library, uh, the link is here. Yeah? So all the analysis plots shown in this presentation were produced with the software. So this is just a comment. So, and I think I, I'm just about uh, in time. Uh, so many thanks uh, for your uh, uh, attention and listening and questions are welcome. <laughs>